Hey, welcome everyone. My guest today is Terrence Rotolo. Uh, you guys have known him from the Resident Evil series. He plays the, uh, the performance capture and the voice now for William Birkin. He's also a very, very popular person with uh, his character Frank West. Everybody loves Frank West. How are you doing, Terrence? Good. How are you doing? Good, good. Hey, can you give us a little background for people who are not too familiar with um, with what everything you do in Hollywood? Well, uh, certainly. I'm uh, I'm an actor and uh, and uh, also a stuntman. I've uh, been I moved here in like the sort of mid to late '90s, and I was lucky enough to to meet the have a good group of friends and and started uh, working fairly uh, fairly quickly uh, in the industry, both uh, as a stuntman and and as an actor. And uh, been doing so now for uh, yeah a little over twenty years, and uh, it's been a it's been an interesting ride, but yeah. it's been a really been a really good one. And um, yeah, I'm just just grateful for the experiences that I had, and uh, you know, always you know moving forward and hopefully upward. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. Did you have intentions uh, when you moved out there to get into stunt work, or is it just something you fell into? Uh, yeah, no, no, I, I didn't, uh, as far as stunt work is concerned. No, I, I moved out here purely as an actor. I was, I, I graduated, uh, I graduated from, uh, the theater department mm -hmm. over at, uh, LSU in, uh, Baton Rouge. And, uh, at the time, uh, you couldn't stay in Louisiana and legitimately call yourself an actor. There's yeah. Just, yeah. There's no opportunities you know, out there. Well, now, now there's a lot of filming going on yeah. in Louisiana, but uh, but yeah, at the time it was either uh, New York or Los Angeles, and I picked Los Angeles because the goal was always uh, film. Right, right, and that's, I mean, where, that's where you go. I love, I love stage very much, uh, but the goal was always film. Yeah, you know, talking about the uh, the market for filming in Louisiana, um, it used to be Texas was big during that time period. Everything was done in Texas. Now. It looks like um, with the taxing laws and everything that changed over the last 15 years, everything moved out to Louisiana and, and uh, Georgia. That's what it looks like. Yeah, yeah. Georgia has actually been very successful mm -hmm. uh, with their – of course, they've been very successful with their film industry. Louisiana has uh, – Louisiana is interesting. It has um, – <laughs> and it, it's it's funny because being from there, it's like I understand sort of Louisiana thinking. And uh, Louisiana's had some starts and stops because originally they had incentives for, you know, to attract film companies to mm -hmm. uh, film there. And then after a while, Louisiana politics sort of got the idea of like, well, now you have all your facilities here. We're going to we're going to bump up. The <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And Hollywood was just like, oh, no, 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 no. No, you know <laughs> we don't work go like somewhere that. else. Yeah, we'll, they did. Yeah, we'll just move yeah. over. <laughs> right, exactly. We'll yeah. just we'll just slide over a bit, and um, so Louis, it's been a bit of a learning curve for Louisiana. Right, right. You know. Yeah. Well, it's a good thing you went out to Hollywood, or you wouldn't be where you are today, I guess, as far as like your career and stunts. And then, uh, you know, we we mentioned this in the intro. Here was talking about you playing William Birkin. For the Umbrella Chronicles, way back in Umbrella Chronicles for a long time. Um, yeah, yeah, it does actually. I didn't realize it until you actually contacted me. For yeah. this, I was, it sort of forced me to reflect and go, "Man, yeah, I've been, yeah, you've been, yeah, you've been doing this wow. for a while." <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was just like, oh, "I guess you're right." Yeah, and the yeah. only uh, other than the original back in 1998, I guess uh, you've been Birkin this whole time, and I don't think people have yeah. realized that it's been the same person because Birkin. We all know him as the monster. We never get to see him so much as the person that much. And he doesn't have a whole exactly. lot of dialogue. Um, so I guess, you know, I, I'm just wondering about that with the the process of making it and, and your thoughts on being him for this whole series. How did you get into the part to begin with? Well, I I actually, that, that uh, I have to credit uh, Ruben Langdon, <laughs> who, uh, who I'm sure you're familiar yeah, with. Yeah, good old Ruben. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a big part of that because Ruben... Um, you know, I've been friends with Ruben for a very long time. Uh, we worked together on Power Rangers for a number of years, and um, and uh, after after Power Rangers, you know, Ruben has very strong uh, associations in Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, he lived there for for a very long time. He 
you know, and, and he has very strong contacts in that world, uh, in the world of gaming and, and, uh, and production. And, uh, and so they would come to, uh, Ruben. Ruben was sort of their American liaison in a way. He, he sort of became, uh, yeah, the American contact, uh, for, for a lot of the game companies and Capcom in particular. And, uh, through our through our work together on Power Rangers, uh, Ruben got to know me both as an actor and as a stuntman, and so it was sort of like a natural fit for doing the motion capture and the action that was required for the motion capture, and the performance aspect of it. Yeah. And so that will, that's what uh, the game requires is actors who are very physical who are, who can. Or, or who are very adept physically, right. and so Ruben was just, you know, Ruben was like, well, I, you know, hey, Capcom, I, I, I know some people, and I know this guy who's a very good actor, and he's a very good, you know, he's very good with action as well, and uh, you know, give him a try, and so that's how that all happened. Yeah, and you guys have been doing this for a long time. Uh, Ruben recently, he was yeah. in the Vendetta movie, um, yep. which was a few years ago, and then you're back here with Resident Evil Two remake. Uh, and from working with Ruben in the beginning, when you guys first started this um, with Umbrella Chronicles, that was through Ruben's studio, if I remember right. Just Cause when he was correct. when he had it back then, uh, before he he passed it on to his partner. Um, right. The the technology you guys used back then has changed so much from then to now. With the, now they had the RE engine and the full performance capture. Everything is pretty much recorded in this you know in the void, getting it done. Uh, what's your thoughts on how the technology has changed since then and grown? Well, I, I, you know, I can't say enough good things about it because, um, because I think to me as a performer, the most important thing to me is story, right? Is storytelling. What all this is about, if you don't have a good story, um, uh, you know, the, it doesn't matter how amazing your action is. It doesn't. It doesn't matter how good your visual effects is. If the, if the story isn't engaging, um, you know, you're not going. You know, the audience has no reason to follow it. Right. And the technol and and the technology as it's moved into more, uh, as it's become more cinematic and more sort of more realistic. Mm -hmm. I think it's. I think it's only accentuated the possibilities in terms of storytelling. Um. And so, uh, and so, I just think it's it's enhanced the experience, you know, uh, you know, tenfold, uh, you know, a hundredfold. Yeah. And uh, and and so, yeah, I, I think I think it's made for a better uh, experience, both in terms of playing the game and just, and and that's why I think the fans have become so uh, enamored, you know, with these games as you know, and with these characters as if you know, they're movie characters or, or characters from a book. Right. And, um, and, and I think the technology has really been, uh, you know, a service in that way. It's, it's just enhanced the, the storytelling uh, capabilities and possibilities. Right. And graphically it looks amazing. It's a beautiful, beautiful game yeah. to watch. Um, it's <clears throat> the character models are, are incredible. The atmosphere, the, um, the, the world they built around it by rebuilding uh, the environments that we knew in a new way. But not only just in the games, but take example like um, the new movie coming out, Alita Battle Angel uses the same technology as pretty Correct. much what they're using in games now. And just seeing the performances of the actors in it, it looks so realistic. And it's just amazing what we could do now and the, like the potential for movies coming out in the future is going to be incredible. Correct. Yeah. And it's only and the thing is, too, it's like for directors, it has to be a very exciting time because <laughs> now you can you can literally shoot in you know any way you want any way you imagine a scene you can practically shoot it that way i mean i remember the first time i was really struck with that was when i saw the third lord of the rings film yeah and they do that shot you know when when gollum finally you know uh gets the ring yeah they do that shot where they pull back through the ring yeah you, you know and you're, you're looking at gollum as he holds the ring up and the camera pulls back through through <laughs> yeah. the the, the ring itself and you're just like that's fabulous you know you yeah. can shoot anywhere you want you know yeah. um uh, so so yeah I, I i think the technology now that they're doing is is fantastic and the other thing 
that I have to say I really love about it is that, you know, when this whole thing of motion capture first started, everybody said, uh, you know, everybody in Los Angeles said, oh, well, that, that does it for, for you actors. You actors are done now. You know, computers are going to do it now. Yeah, right. <laughs> you, know, you know, we're not going to have any more actors. And, um, and what I love is that actually it's gone the opposite direction. Mm-hmm. It's like now you need you need actors in this area more than ever because because there's still that um, there's still those human nuances that right. the computer is able to capture, but still make it you know you still need a real person there for it to feel real. Yeah, yeah. Now you know what they yeah. said that well, you know that's it for you actors. But over the years, as the technology has improved. The level required of acting skills has uh, also gone up. So now you're seeing these, you know, very talented actors that are kind of bridging the gap between, you know, live action and computer generated, and bringing the, uh, I guess, the the skill level, the overall quality is on par now to where video games are telling stories that Hollywood probably could never do. And not only that, you're spending more time with these characters, you're living in that world longer, so you relate more than going to a two-hour movie. Uh, in this case, you're, you know, sometimes 10 hours in this world with this character. So you get this strong connection and you, this emotional connection to the, to the content, to the quality of the story. That's correct. Yeah, I, I would, I would agree a hundred percent with that. It's incredible. It's um, really, really amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And it, and it really is, uh, quite honestly, I, I think it's a kind of revolution in, in storytelling and, uh, and, uh, and, and filmmaking in a yeah. way. I mean, yeah. Uh, it, it's interesting, but but the game industry has really gotten what what we're really talking about here is filmmaking. Yeah, and, yeah. And uh, you know, and that's why the games are so cinematic now. And I and I th- I think it's wonderful. It really I is. Think it's, I think I think story I think storytelling actually is one of the most important things uh, to human beings, and it's one of the reasons why I got into this into this business in the first place. I mean, stories uh, affected me a great deal. Uh, growing up, and 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 were and were a guiding force in my life uh, as a, as a kid. Right. And so, I, so for me, sto- there's there's nothing. There are few things more important than good storytelling. Yeah, and then not only the technology, but the stories have evolved in gaming as well uh, to telling these very uh, detailed and, and and incredible stories. Yeah. But on that, you know, but and in saying that, it, it it sort of makes me think about, you know, William Birkin. It's like, <laughs> hey guys, you know, William Birkin, you know, I in a way when we did the remake, uh, you know, there there was a little there was a little more attention to to his to his backstory and his connection to uh, to Sherry and all this, mm-hmm. you know, to his daughter. But uh, but yeah, I have to say, it's like it's like, you know, as an actor, I'm like. Yeah, you know, can we? <laughs> it would be nice, to give William, a little, a, a few more things to say right, before right. he, like, before he grosses out. You know what I mean? And yeah. and, and turns into a frittata. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah, frittata. Yeah. yeah, exactly. You know, I I would love to have seen him. We've seen him so many times, and they keep retelling the same story for him because it's you know Resident Evil Two is an iconic game, and you know Willie B is the big bad guy. Uh, how many yeah. times have we seen him get shot now and then take the needle and inject himself and become the G monster? Yeah. But can we just give him a little bit more dialogue, maybe some backstory? They This time they kind of gave more story about the family that we already kind of knew, but they it went through everybody else because at this point, uh, Birkin's already become the monster. We only get to see the flashbacks right. again. So it'd be nice to give yeah, him a little more dialogue. Right. <laughs> yeah, that, that's right. And the thing is, too, is I feel, I in a way, just... just you know, playing the guy, it's like I, I feel like William kind of gets a bad rap because we always sort of see him. He's already tweaked. Yeah. You know, when when you see him, even even as a, even as just a man before he takes the the G virus, he's sort of he he's already has a, a you know what is questionable. He, his character is already in question. Right. And uh, you know, and and uh, you know, I, I'm thinking it might be interesting just to sort of you know see who he was before before the fall right you know before the I mean? meltdown because, yeah yeah before the meltdown exactly and and it's like uh you know we never quite see that with him he already 
Yeah, we already see when by the time you see uh, William, he's already a little tweaked. Right. You know, he's already right. a little weird. Yeah. It's yeah, it's a very physical role because not only are you doing uh, the Birkin as himself, but you're doing the monster as well. And correct. I mean, that's where a lot of your physical acting ability comes in because you have to become this monster and take it through its evolutions and terrorize the player. So going into that, uh, what is it like for you to prepare mentally and physically to become William Birkin? Well, I, I, I have to say, I mean, it's, it's, you know, first and foremost, it's fun. It's, it's, it's a lot of, it's a lot of fun. And actually, um, what I love, what I really love about the mo the the performance capture process mm -hmm. is that it reminds me, and, and it really it really allows me to bring in my stage experience. Oh uh, right, right. Performance capture and motion capture, to me, is very very similar to uh, to stage acting rather than film acting. Okay. And um, because because you're 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 performing in a space of you know the the when you're when you're actually doing it of course the setting isn't you don't uh you're told you're in a particular location but that location doesn't physically exist right and so you have to sort of imagine it and so that to me is like is like doing black box theater or minimalist theater you okay. have to you know you you make the uh surroundings real in your imagination and if you do a good job on stage, the audience believes it, and it works. Um, so that, to me, is very, very akin to stage. But the the process of doing characters like William Burke and the and the uh, and the G Monster, it's it is a lot of fun, but it's exhausting as hell. Because, <laughs> yeah. Um, because it do, it does require a lot of energy because because I'm I'm playing a monster that is that towers over people right and so you have to sort of try to physically convey that size when you're not that size <laughs> you know what i mean yeah, yeah. It's like a lot of times a lot of times i'm shorter than the actors i'm threatening so it's like <laughs> you know what i mean it's yeah. just, i'm just physically you know it's like so so portraying that size uh and, and really conveying that size so the so the performance gets it and it's and it's in there it's it it can be very physically tax, taxing both on you know the body and your voice, and uh, the uh, the creators and the director was so specific about the different developments mm -hmm. of of the of the G monster and and the physicality had to be specifically different at each stage um, as the as the creature evolved. Uh, I would I would leave at the end of the day just exhausted. Just, <laughs> Just dead, yeah. Yeah, just <laughs> yeah. and uh, you know, but that's as it should be. You know that that's as it should be. Yeah, you, know, you go I, in I don't and put it all, that. put it all out there. Yeah, I don't, I don't <laughs> that. Yeah, I don't mind that at all. I, I, you know, that's that's why I got into this business. It's, it, it's, um, but it is exhausting. Yeah. Do they do anything? Uh, like I know when I was talking, to, I believe Stephanie um, recently, she was saying that. You know, they they attach this basically this rod to your back, and they put the the ball on top for them to focus. Like this is the our voc our focal point for us to look up at the monster. Uh, do they yeah. ever do anything for you as far as like maybe elevating you, putting you on some stilts or something, just to give you a little more height or to make you a little more imposing as far as the shots concerned, or is it strictly just the ball on the on the rod or the antenna? Well, the ball the ball on the rod is for is for what is for what you know it's for the characters uh, for the hero's eye line. Right. They have to be. They have to be looking up at something. They, you know, they have to be looking up at a particular angle and 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 reacting. So, so that's what that's what that's all about. Uh, there have been, you know, of, of course, there were times when I was on platforms. But to right. be honest, most of that was done when the when the monster himself is up on like, uh, you know, is up on a scaffold and is jumping down. Okay. Uh, so so, you know, there and there were a few times where where I'm standing on uh, Apple boxes or, or a platform or something like that. But usually, particularly uh, in, in this, this new version, the, the, the character and the monster are moving a lot. So I can't really be up on a platform because he's moving, he's attacking things, things of this nature. So, 
so yeah, it's like I have kind of you know I had sort of the stick you know with the with the uh, with the ball, mm-hmm. so the characters know where to look. But I'm I'm physically not up on a platform. Right, right. I'm, I'm at them. You know, I'm moving at them. I'm attacking them. So I have to be. I have to be on this. I physically have to be on the same level as the actors, so I can interact with them. Okay. And then the the physical movements, like um, uh, William Burke in his first stage, I guess you would call it, when he uh, still has a head <laughs> and everything. Yeah. One of his one of his yeah. main go tos in the, in the storylines has always been that pipe. What uh, they give you, like, yeah. are, are you? throwing around like a pool noodle or something or like a foam noodle or something what, what are you speaking around yeah i mean it's it, it changes usually it's just a pvc pipe oh okay uh yeah usually it's just a pvc pipe because yeah foam noodle it <laughs> it, it, it it just weighs too much it's it's too flimsy oh okay uh, and so they and so they have to and they have to put markers there there are markers that are put on that 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 has to be you know, captured as well. Okay. And uh, so, so yeah, I, I mean, a foam noodle would be nice. It's like it would be safe and, and certainly lighter. But uh, I remember the first time we tried it, they gave me a metal pipe and I was like, guys, I, you know, <laughs> sure. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to cave Stephanie's head in with the, you know, because it's just, it was just too heavy, yeah. you know? And I was just, you know, yeah, it was just too heavy to, to fling around with one arm. And uh, so, so yeah, it's, um, yeah, so we just we just changed it to a PVC pipe, and that was and that was totally fine. Uh, but then there were also I had arm extensions at at one point as well. Oh wow! Where uh, to to sort of uh, for certain for certain shots they they wanted to have the scale of the of the arm, mm-hmm. and so I would have I, I would have a uh, you know I, I would have some sort of uh, structure that they could motion capture, and I would just grab onto that to to mimic uh the arm so it was in proper scale to me okay and um so yeah so a lot of times we did that as well how was the uh the process of working with uh stephanie and eliza being um eliza being younger and stephanie playing for claire and everything their story is very closely connected to william perkins not so much for leon leon has a few moments with them but um right how was that working with stephanie and eliza uh, it's fantastic. I mean, Stephanie. I've worked with Stephanie uh, a few times now. Oh, really? And, and, yeah, she's always she's always wonderful. Uh, you know, she's you know she's a very accomplished, very talented, uh, very talented actor. And uh, the girl playing uh, Sherry. This is my first time working with her, but but yeah, I mean, again, it's it's a lot like doing a play. And okay. uh, and and so so yeah, we're we're very much working together and collaborating together both on movement and uh and and because the technology has gotten so precise in terms of capturing performances you know at at first when i first started doing this it was it was almost entirely about movement okay. you know because yeah. the technology simply wasn't there to capture you know facial expressions and and emotional nuance and all this and now because it because it's so photorealistic uh the conversations have shifted dramatically to talking about, you know, emotion and even for the monster, it's like the, the, the monster is having, uh, is having a, a sort of emotional response to seeing Sherry Mm -hmm. and how that has to. Yeah. And so we, we find ourselves now talking about subtlety in performance and, and emotional content, uh, just like you would on a film or, or, or a television show. Or a play when you're talking about you know what's going on with the with uh, what internally is going on with these characters. Yeah. And uh, and and yeah. Again, it's it's coming back to to me. It's it's like filmmaking. We're making a film. It it feels like we're shooting a movie as opposed to quote unquote a game. Right. And that internal um, development with the character now that since it's so much of a, a full performance capture. Um, what do you do, I guess, in between transformations to get to that next level of animalistic, um, you know, approach basically that, that came with the evolution of Birkin? Uh, I'm, well, I'm a very, phys- I mean, I'm a very, I, I, I'm a very physical actor. So for me, uh, a lot of the preparation is just physically getting warmed up. Okay. Um, uh, I, I, so, so I'll be. You know, I'll be doing physical warm-ups. You know, whether that's 
you know, push-ups or, or whatever, or stretching or, or things like this, it's like, I, I have to have, uh, I have to have my, my, uh, physical capabilities, uh, accessible to me. So I find in preparation and throughout the day, I'm constantly warming up. And so it's sort of like this, this, uh, calisthenic, you know, this all day calisthenic workout to, mm -hmm. uh, to, be prepared for each scene and each iteration of, of the monster so I can convey it fully and so that the uh, the people rendering can can capture a, a fuller and more complete performance. Okay. And so I can also hit uh, differences. I have to say the challenges, the challenge with this new version of, uh, with the remake of, of uh, Resident Evil uh, was that, uh, the thing, and, and what kind of surprised me actually, was that was that the differences between each evolution of the creature were so specific right and so and so the you know each the director and the uh, developers were both like at at this stage the monster can do this you know these are the limitations these are the enhancements and we need to show that and i was like oh okay and and i was sort of like yeah it, it was very very specific and so I had to be prepared at each iteration to convey those little specifics that they were talking about. Okay. And then the the guttural growl that he always has, you know, for, for yelling out for Sherry, uh, how did you come to that? Was that directed for you to get there or is that something you just kind of naturally produced? Uh, that's something I'm naturally producing. And, <laughs> and I have to say, in the yeah, in the voice sessions, it's like, yeah, I'm leaving there. I'm leaving there at the end of the session with zero voice. Left. <laughs> yeah. it's like, you know, I'm just, you know, it's, it's one of these things where it's like, it's like they tell you they the director, the, the directors and the developers talk, you know, we all talk about what, what their idea of what it is. Mm -hmm. And then you just sort of go for it. And uh, yeah, I've, I've thrashed my voice. Uh, <laughs> quite often. <laughs> yeah. Well, you it's know, it's, it's pretty much a roar. I mean, it's not like like I said a growl, yeah. but it's not a growl. It's a roar. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's sort of like, and I mean, uh, yeah, and and uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, I, I think you know, doing those. I, I think the vo the vocal sessions, the the voiceover sessions, have been uh, just as physically tasking as the as the performance capture sessions because in order to get there. In order to get that roar, I, you know, I physically have to ramp up to to do it. So I'm in the studio, like move. I'm in the uh, I'm in the sound studio, mm -hmm. like physically moving around. And thankfully, you know, Rouge has has sort of provided a space uh, in the uh, in the sound booth that you can move around. It used to be like little more than a closet, and yeah. now it's like a room where you can physically move around. And particularly for this game, you know, I found myself like on the floor, like on all fours, like, you know, really getting into it. And right. uh, that helped a great deal. But, yeah, my voice is completely thrashed at the oh, end of the man, session. Man. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, kind of like my last question for Birkin here. Uh, do you ever get sick of Hunk shooting you? Because you've been shot by Hunk so many times now. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah okay yes that's all i can Definitively, say that's yes. all i can say about that is yes <laughs> yes I, I take a lot of gunfire and i you know and it's like and at this point i'm I'm like taking it personally it's just like you know <laughs> it needs to be a reverse yeah. role one day where you get to finally take out hunk for real <laughs> yeah you know it's like you know I, I would love to you know it'd be great just to have a fun scene where the monster goes you know how you like it you know it's like <laughs> it, it sort of stings after a while you know it's like yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's it's like doing gunshot reactions. It's like after you know, after a while, you're like, oh come on, you know. Yeah, I mean, like, how many times yeah. I got to get shot today? <laughs> yeah, how many times? Yeah, yeah. And I even, you know, and even when I, uh, you know, even when I put this on social media, I'm just like, hey, enemies, you know, <laughs> you know, people who don't like me, enjoy the game because yeah, right. you know you get to shoot me a lot. Yeah, so, you know, yeah. yeah. You, enjoy. Yeah, Burkins, he's a. An ammo sponge, man. If it's fighting him, is yeah. you really yeah. have to make sure you're walking to that fight prepared every time because he just soaks up bullets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's it's it becomes one of those things where it's like, hey, you know, hey, heroes. Uh, yeah, you may, you know, 
you might want to switch tactics because I don't think the bullets are working. Yeah, and you know his uh his evolution in this game and your portrayal and just the way they they created Birkin and this one the new environments you fight him in. Uh, even though they're reminiscent of the old environments, the fights are so intense because you always yeah. feel like you're in this tight space that you don't know you know how much ammo it's going to take. You're running down to your last bullets. You're running out of health items, and he just never stops. Yeah, yeah, and I I think that's one of the great. Uh, I, I I really think that's one of the big pluses to this game is like you said that the 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 environments are are very claustrophobic. They're very creepy. It's it's just I I think the um, I think the game really, really works uh, on that level as as a as a you know as a piece of of the horror genre. I think it I think it works really wonderfully that way. Yeah, it's good to come back to it too. The survival horror genre has slipped off uh, for a while. It's started going down a path of uh, more action oriented, and uh, the the horror genre itself moved into almost like a first person uh, point of view type style. And we started to get a lot of yeah. those games, and we kind of wanted to go back to the roots of third-person survival horror with limited resources and um, immense amount of enemies and creepy atmosphere. And uh, they they did it, and this game brought it all back. It's so well done. Yeah, yeah, I you know I yeah, I completely agree with you on that. Yeah, it's kind of surreal talking to you right now because all I hear is Frank West. <laughs> I I, I love yeah, it. Yeah. I yeah, love it. I know. It's so yeah, awesome. I, 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 <laughs> I've got I've gotten that before where where people feel it's a, yeah I've, I've heard that you know where people say oh I feel like it and the fact is is that yeah it's like I I really for Frank I I just that was just my voice I, yeah. I that's just yeah and that's kind of how I talk I'm I'm a bit of a smart aleck and it's like <laughs> and and so yeah I I'm I miss Frank I have to say I miss Frank and I know we miss you uh, we're gonna kind of get into that a little bit later about our thoughts on that but. Uh, talking about Frank, how did you get that part? Again, was that something of your relationship with Ruben and the fact that he was working with the studio to do it and they just, you were the guy? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I mean, I wish I wish I had a more interesting story about that, but <laughs> there was a time, there was, you know, but it, it it's literally, I mean, that literally is the story. I mean, there was a time, uh, you know, when Ruben and Just Cause had, had you know, he, he had, you uh, just cause was still fairly new where he was uh you know where he was bringing me and and Dan Southworth yeah. and and other other friends of his into uh you know who are other actors to uh to audition for a number of different games and uh he had me you know and and uh, Dead Rising quite honestly at the time for me was just another audition yeah and uh and so I I went in and and you know Ruben called me and said hey you know I want I want you to read for this character and I didn't even know it was a lead character I didn't even know it was just, like, it was just, it was just you know Ruben was like I just want to put you on tape for this character and I was like oh, okay and so I he you know he gave me a you know part of the script and and I came in and I did the audition and uh, a couple of weeks later uh, Ruben called me and he was like you know and he told me that uh, when he showed them my tape. Uh, Capcom was just like that's you found Frank. That's that's, what, that's exactly Frank. what we wanted. That's him. <laughs> yeah, it's like that's that's Frank. That's the character we we envisioned. It's like that's him. <laughs> and uh, you know, and then seeing Frank, I'm like, oh, I'm not quite sure how to take that, but okay, you know, <laughs> like, you know, all right. That's the thing about Frank. He's uh like you said, he's he's a bit of a smart aleck. Uh, well, not a bit. He's very much a smart aleck. He's got that attitude about him. Uh, but he's such a cool dude. And he's fun to play. He's fun. Like, I've always enjoyed... Uh, I was actually kind of like getting a refresher on Dead Rising 1 this week since I was going to be talking to you. So I went back I was playing it again. I was like, man, I really miss this game. I miss, like, Frank Frank, you know? <laughs> this is so awesome. Yeah, yeah. I've, I, and I've, I'm, thank you for saying that. I, I've, I've heard that as well from, from, uh, from a few people. And, and that's, that's really nice to hear. Uh, the the experience of making the first Dead Rising was a was a really wonderful experience. Uh, you know, I I went out to uh, you know I went out to Japan uh, to do that, and the uh, the director and the create it was a it was a very collaborative process. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I was working with T.J. Storm and some of the you know who's who's you know uh, one of the top performers in the business. Mm -hmm. and uh just the whole cast it it was a it's it's a really uh it, it's a really 
special memory uh, to me, making particularly making the the first one because it was just it was very collaborative, it was very creative, and uh, we really bonded as a group uh, on that on that game. It's a very special memory. Yeah, Ruben, uh, he's so tied in with uh, Capcom, and then his ties with Power Rangers has really it created a family for what seems like a long time because yes. he, um, yes. you know, his not his time working with you guys on Power Rangers, but he brought you guys into the Capcom side, and you guys made a bunch of games and content together. And I love that about Ruben that he he like I said he created this family of actors, and you guys were in a lot of things together, like with you and like you said Dan, um, even bringing in Aaron later. For, to play a part in the Vendetta movie, it's just such a cool sure. thing, you know. I I really have a lot of uh, respect for him to do that, and I love that he did that. Ruben's an extraordinary guy. He really he, is. He really is. He has a, he has a he has a he has a great deal of uh, uh, personal and professional integrity, and he's just he's 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 a you know he's a wonderful uh, person to work with, and and he's a he's a wonderful friend. He's he's a he's a top notch guy. And, yeah, he definitely uh, I'm is. Very, very fortunate. I'm very fortunate to have met him and to have worked with him, and and he's a very good friend. Yeah. Yeah. I, I and quite frankly, it's it's uh you know if if Ruben calls me for anything, I'm just like I don't care what it is. It's just like I'm there, man. Yeah. Whatever you need me to do, <laughs> whatever you need, I'm there. You know, yeah. it's it's you know, and and there are very few people that you that you feel that way about that. It's like hey, you know. If they just call up and go, uh, I need you for something, you just go, sure, man, whatever it is. I don't, I don't need to hear about it. Just tell me when to be there. I'm there. Exactly. You exactly. Know? Not, uh, it's like that line from that movie, The Town, with Ben Affleck and Jeremy Renner. It's like I've got to ask you something. Uh, some people are going to get hurt, and I need to know if you're okay with it. Whose car are we taking? <laughs> it's just like, you yeah. know, there's, there's no yeah. question yeah. about it. It's a loyalty. It's a, a respect for each other that, you know, right. I don't need the details. Yeah. Let's just do it. <laughs> Yeah, he's it's it's a it's a ride or die relationship. Exactly, so, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so you said when um when he sent your audition out to, to Capcom in Japan, they're like, "That's Frank," uh, and you were like, "Oh, okay." I, I it's like, oh, I guess, yeah, I'll take that. So now that you've played Frank and you became the character for for so long, uh, what was it like coming like coming to the character, discovering okay, this is who this guy is, and and uh, building that connection between you and Frank. Oh, well, for me, honestly, I, I was just sort of when I well, when I finally figured out, first of all, first of all, it was fear because mm -hmm. I didn't know that Frank was a lead character. I've I've kind of made my bones uh, playing supporting characters. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I just so I just naturally assumed when I auditioned that Frank was a supporting character. And and, uh, you know, D you know, Dan Southworth always gets all the lead characters. He gets <laughs> yeah. all the hero guys, Dan. You know, <laughs> It's all the machismo, you know, hero guys, and rightfully so. He, you know, it's like that's, you know, and rightfully so. Yeah. But so, so when I when I learned when when uh, Ruben finally broke it to me that Frank was the lead of this game, I was just sort of like, you know, at, at first it was, it was a bit of a shock and a bit of fear because I was like, you know, do I can I carry a lead character? You know what I mean? Can mm -hmm. I? Can I basically, you know, carry a, a storyline, you know, uh, on my back and do this? There was initially a little bit of uh, fear, uh, but then as I as I got more acquainted to who the character really was, I have to say I got really excited because honestly, I see Frank as sort of Han Solo. Yeah, you know, yeah, he's exactly. Sort of, he's sort of this wise guy who who who's a good guy, but he's a reluctant good guy. Yeah, you know he. <laughs> You know, um, Frank, sort of like Han Solo, kind of sees himself as this really pragmatic, practical guy, sort of looking out for his own best interests. But he has this pull to do the right thing. Yeah. yeah. And um, and uh, so, yeah, that's 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 how I and that's how I still see Frank. I see Frank sort of as the the Han Solo of the zombie apocalypse world. You know? Yeah. It's um, that's, a good, that, that's a good way to put it. Guy. Yeah, he he's is the that reluctant guy. hero. <laughs> yeah, he's the reluctant hero. Dead Rising was a newer concept, I think, in especially in the zombie world. It was uh, an op like an open world sandbox, basically. There's thousands of zombies, and even more so as the series progresses. Like I remember playing two for the first time, just walking out and seeing just a, a sea of zombies in comparison to the first one, yeah. where there was a few patches where there weren't zombies. 
Uh, but still, there's so many on screen. Uh, it's very action oriented as far as you know, everything's a weapon. <laughs> you know, um, uh, right. just right. you get points for killing zombies. Uh, you've got people to save. You've got a storyline. You've got these psycho enemies that you have to fight off. What was it like making that? Uh, as far as like the development process, because it was really something new. It wasn't tight corridor, three or four zombies, one big monster. In this case, it was like free for all. Yeah, well, to be honest, that's that the the free the free for all aspect, which I think is just good fun because mm-hmm. it's like yeah, you know, just just go in there and just wreck, you know, just <laughs> yeah. wreck people. You know yeah. what I mean, uh, that's that's to to be perfectly honest, that's more of the gameplay aspect. Mm-hmm. Uh, of the, of the game and particularly for for the first dead rising uh when when uh when i was in japan and we were making it our focus was more of the storyline and right, dealing, yeah. with, dealing with the psycho characters and dealing with the the storyline of how frank of how frank sort of becomes this the this reluctant hero he goes in just looking for a story mm-hmm. and sort of how he gets sort of caught up in, uh, and finds out like he's the only one who can do the right thing. Yeah. Uh, when, you know, when, when other characters have, have kind of an agenda and, and, and dealing with that. And so, so our, our process in making it, we were dealing with this, with the storyline aspects. The, the free for all is sort of in the, in the gameplay. Um, and so there were, there were a number of, for me, uh, I sort of recall a lot of these dramatic moments of 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 uh, starting fights with psycho characters, um, you know, helping characters. I remember, the, uh, as a matter of fact, I remember the death scene. Uh, T.J. Storms uh, had a character who was, you know, who was dying, and mm-hmm. we did this. We did this incredible. Uh, we did this really great death scene, and I remember. Uh, you know, where he's dying and I'm sort of there with him. And uh, when we finished the scene, like, I remember the the Japanese crew being like, you know, being like (laughs) moved and everyone was really quiet and and very respectful and all this. And and they were like, oh, that was so sad. And (laughs) and it's like, you know, and and, and, uh, TJ and I were were just sort of like, oh, great. You know, (laughs) know, know, mission accomplished. Yeah, exactly. Like, great. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, I, I, I didn't get the fun Frank has of just wasting zombies. To be <laughs> did they do you any know, of the, I, um, the movements like, uh, as far as like the attacks, did you record any of that or is that still to them? Like the, oh, yeah, okay. yeah. I mean, I, there would be times. Yeah, absolutely. There would be times when I was, there were many times where I was alone on the, just on swinging the things. motion, ca- yeah. motion <laughs> capture stage, just going through different movements. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, and just you know, just going through all the different movements. So yeah, a lot of the swings and all are me, but I didn't get to like you know, there wasn't anyone opposite right. me that I was swinging you know, that I was working. <laughs> yeah, and that, yeah, I was just like, oh damn, you know, it's like oh, okay. Yeah. Um, one of the things that Ruben told me about when the game came out, uh, he called me. He said, he said, hey man, he goes, um, you know, I. He said, "I, I want to tell you." He goes, "One of the one of the fav- one of the uh, more uh, famous things about the game is the is the uh, Frank run." <laughs> yeah, Frank, the run. Frank, yeah, how Frank runs is uh, apparently fans really like the particular way he runs, and it's like that's my run. So it's like, <laughs> yeah, I was know, thinking about that. Worse, but, yeah, that's how I that's how I run. So it's like okay. You know. Yeah, yeah. So the run is is memorable. Uh, the skateboard. I used to skateboard a lot because it's quickly to get from yeah. point A to point B. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Exactly. And I and I I'm terrible on a skateboard. Just, <laughs> well, Frank's not much better, so he doesn't right. he doesn't it's turn. Not, he just exactly. stops. Yeah, art art mimics life. Art mimics life. <laughs> it's such a it's an awesome game. It really is. It's so much fun. Um, and I'm, it was successful. People loved it because it was that palate cleanser from the serious Resident Evil to this fun, over the top, uh, crazy, almost like a beat 'em up. You know, you just thousands of zombies going to work on them, and it's a good stress relief. Yeah. You know, you don't have to like get too wrapped up in everything. You can just sit back and enjoy it and enjoy these crazy interactions with other characters that are just these insane, you know, stereotypes of of villains and stuff. It's so much fun, and it's no wonder. I mean, yeah. they. I, it was successful. People loved it. So they obviously, they went and made Dead Rising 2. 
But I think what shook people was like, well, where's Frank? You know, we got the new yeah. guy, uh, Green, but where's, you know, you got Chuck, but where's Frank? We all want Frank. We, that's why we love the game because of Frank, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, that's the thing. It's like, yeah, everywhere, you know, yes, audiences get attached to certain characters. And, and particularly when you, when you switch characters that quickly, it, it doesn't, yeah, for, I, I think for the audience, there, yeah, you know, it, it feels, it, it 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 doesn't quite, you know, it doesn't quite feel like the first time to uh, to coin a phrase. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I agree with you. So what happened with that? Why? Uh, why did they decide? I guess I don't. I mean, story wise, I will say that the story was good. The game was still a lot of fun. Um, it was a lot more personal, I guess, with Chuck's story because in this case of instead of having fun with Frank in this horrible situation. Now you've actually got his daughter that you have to look after and, and take care of. And it brought a, a level of that attachment. And now I have a responsibility other than just taking pictures and slaying zombies. Um, right. But um, why, why do you think they did that? Why didn't they come to you and, and bring Frank back immediately? Because they did, did, they did bring him back. Yeah, well, I, I think I, the thing is, I think there's been an overall trend. Uh, and actually, you can see it in movies as well of, of – uh, I think audiences want to they they want to have a a a more personal connection to the characters they're following even even if it's a bad guy. Mm -hmm. And uh you know I'm going to reference uh you know uh the uh the last Avengers movie, right? Infinity War. Right. I mean that movie just as an example, that movie is basically Thanos's movie. Exactly. Exactly. That movie's about that movie's about Thanos. Yes, it is. And, and the thing is, is like, and so it really, to me, that that sort of really, what you see there is um, filmmakers establishing a personal connection with a villain, which is fairly new. You know, that's a fairly new concept mm -hmm. where villains, you see their motivation for why they're doing what they're doing, and and so it's not so black and white anymore. Right. 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 And and I think and I think that was the the main concept to bringing uh to to uh bringing uh Chuck in was that it was a more personal connection. And so over the course of these games and as they become more cinematic and you see it even in film, there's there's been this push to there's been this uh, steady push towards a more personal connection you know the that the audience has a more personal connection even with the villain yeah yeah and they, so, yeah and so i think there might have been a decision there to like make the story more personal and it's kind of clear you don't get the sense that frank has like family that he has roots right you know uh you really don't get that sense that that you know frank is this is this kind of lone wolf in the world and uh and sort of likes it that way or 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 at least outwardly likes to you know you know likes his life to be that way and so i think there was this idea of like well let's have a more personal story let's let's have a character and his his whole motivation is his daughter right he's got some stakes yeah. in the in the in the game basically right right and and so it's like yeah exactly and so i think i think there was an initial decision not to give Frank a daughter, you know, or to give him family per se. Yeah, you know, it's funny. Yeah, it, it came out and it was it was still a good game, still enjoyable. It was still Dead Rising, but um, there was some backlash, you know, not having Frank. And as sure. much as people like Chuck, um, they made the decision to go ahead and bring Frank back and give you basically the same game from your perspective, from Frank's perspective. And you even get to fight Chucky, which was kind of like for the fans that weren't happy about Chuck. <laughs> this was a uh, yeah. Like, here, here you go. Um, go, you know. Yeah. Be happy about this. Go kill the guy you didn't like. I guess you know, it's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Were you happy yeah, well, uh, I, to find out that they were going to bring you back again? Oh, of course, oh, of course. I mean, I, I, I really, I, I have to say, it's like I, I really like Frank, and I'm really honored that I, that I got to, uh, that I got to play him um, because I, I, you know, it's as close. I feel like, I, I feel like at, at this stage, it's as close as I'll get to playing, you know, Han Solo. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Uh, and uh and uh but i'm i'm really glad i yeah i'm i'm really proud of the fact that the character was such a that that fans were able to connect to him 
and uh, and that I got to play him. I think he's a wonderful character. I think he's a wonderful. Uh, I think he's a wonderful sort of archetype that I've always loved. Uh, at, you know, it's a character archetype that I've always loved and admired. And um, and I'm glad that you know I you know just as a professional and, and also as a personal mark, you know I got to I got to uh, do that. Um, but I but I and I also think that the reason they Capcom saw the need to bring Frank back is that the Dead Rising franchise is sort of a devil has sort of a devil may care feel to it. I think that was the aim yeah. in its conception, and and Frank is the embodiment of that devil may care attitude it's like you know okay well you know if i've got a you know if i got to blow up a, a shopping mall to to win you know okay i'll blow up a shopping mall exactly. you know what i mean and, yeah. and it's that sort of yeah it's, it's uh you know damn the torpedoes kind of attitude and devil may care attitude that you also sort of see in uh that marvel has created with guardians of the galaxy exactly, you know guardians yeah. of the galaxy is sort of a different take on the hero on the on the hero genre yeah and it's you know, and um, and it only works with those. It, it it only works with those characters. You know, those characters embody that feeling, and and I think is the same is true with Frank. And it's refreshing to have that kind of character in a situation like this. Certainly. We see the heroes. Yeah, we see the good guys with the emotional attachments, and you know, the always straight and narrow path. And you, it's nice to have a guy that comes in with that attitude occasionally. Like yes, like you said, who's got that devil may care? Who's a little bit of a wild card and is okay with blowing up a mall? <laughs> it's like it's okay yeah, with me to do absolutely. that. <laughs> so it's yeah. it's good to have that that kind of character, and it's obviously yeah. the, the fans yeah. love it as much as you love it. The fans love them too because uh, it didn't stop there. We did get new characters in Dead Rising uh, for the third one, but Frank himself and you as Frank have carried on for many years in the Marvel versus Capcom series. Yes, yeah, and that's. That's always that's always fun. That was that was a, a very nice surprise as well when I got when I got the call for that. I was like I was like, so is this a dead? Ra-? And they're like, no, no, no. This is Marvel vs. Cat. It's a you know, it's a fighting game. Yeah. And I was like, oh, that. I was like, oh, that's really nice. It's like you know, bringing <laughs> Frank into that fold. You know, even though it's like you know, I I don't know what Frank's going to do with a baseball bat against Thanos, but okay, <laughs> uh, you know, all right. It's you know, fun to camera, see, yeah. a camera and a baseball bat, yeah. and you know, and I'm there fighting Spider Man. It's like, uh, guys, <laughs> really? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's it's fun to see uh, him in that kind of situation because he really doesn't belong there. But no, the way no. they the way they make these games, they make it work to where he's a formidable fighter in the game, and it gives you a lot of fun dialogue. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and it's it's sort it's sort of like you know I appreciate, it. but even even I was just sort of like, oh man, Frank's gonna get. Wasted. He's just he's he, like, he really should be in here. Yeah. Right. So like, and, yeah. I mean, and not that. I mean, just as a storyline, it's like he's just a guy with a bat and a camera. It's it like not be this there. is so unfair. <laughs> yeah. You know. Versus, like you said, yeah. someone like Thanos or or all these superheroes, these super powered beings, <laughs> and, and there he is right. taking pictures and making uh, making jokes. <laughs> yeah. Not even a healing factor or anything. Nope. It's just yeah. It's like yeah. But it's cool because it gave you all these interactions with really cool characters outside of, you know, Desert, Dead Rising and, and uh, like, with Spider-Man and everything, both being photographers and just all these awesome moments. It's just cool. Sure. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 it's uh, yeah, it's really been a, a terrific, uh, I, I never really, uh, as, as an actor, you never see this kind of unfoldment with a character and it's just, it's, it it's, it's quite uh it's quite an honor honestly mm-hmm. it's it's uh it's it's quite an honor to to kind of see that that thing happen with the character that you play it's, it's i'm very grateful yeah to to I'm go back say, to the I'm beginning i'm very grateful <laughs> to go back to the beginning and being nervous that you're taking on a lead in a way and then just to see you know all these years later that people really love the character and they keep getting a chance to to come back to him and then yeah and then Dead Rising Four happened. <laughs> I don't know what went wrong with that. I, I, I'm just I'm wondering why they went with someone else, and then the fans did not like that at all. They, they brought yes, Frank back, but <laughs> but it wasn't Frank. Yeah, I I, I know. I, I got uh, you know, and I, and let me tell you something. I, I have to you know uh, shout out to the fans because 
you know, a number of fans reached out to me uh, on social media, and, and of course they did the they did the fan petitions, mm-hmm. and uh, I was just I was just blown away by that effort. I mean, you know, the 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 fans are what are are what make this are the lifeblood of this uh, of these industry and of these games, and it's like, and uh, they were just incredible. I mean, just really, really incredible. I was really impressed with their with their effort and with their, you know, dedication to to the characters and to the character and, and to the storyline. Um, now, and and I, I don't want to, you know, Capcom. I I love work, every time I've worked with Capcom. It's it's never been anything but an A plus experience. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but and I and I was aware of the uh, of the of the PR with the rollout of, uh, of, you know, uh, dead rising, uh, dead rising four. Um, but I, I have to offer a little bit of, you know, a little bit of uh, pushback because, because I did see some of the statements that, that Capcom, you know, talked about in, in their choice, uh, in their choices in doing dead rising four and for the choices they made with Frank. And, um, but, but what a lot of people, uh, I think uh, one fact that gets missed is that Dead Rising, at the time that Dead Rising Four was being made, uh, the Screen Actors Guild, of which I, you know I'm a union member, right. was in a was in a very very heated battle with the gaming industry about uh, getting uh, getting a standardized contract. Up until that point, uh, the most of the gaming gaming industry didn't have a any contractual standards about rates and and any of this thing right and so uh, and, and so at the time the screen actors guild was was and and uh and the gaming companies were in very serious and often uh contentious negotiations over that fact and so as a as a as a union member you know one of the things i think the game industry did was was go well you know then we won't use union actors, and right. I'm a union actor, right? And so, and so I think you know that in a nutshell was was one of the motivating factors for why the voice of Frank was changed, you know, and and why those decisions were made. Uh, yeah, is yeah. that is that the game was being made right in the middle while the while those negotiations were going on, and while those negotiations were were rather heated right and so you know what i mean it's like so that's i think that's why that that happened um i think that was a big reason as to why that happened and why they decided to change the voice um you know and and get another performer to to do the voice and look you know at the end of the day frank west you know is a capcom creation He's, you know, he's part of Capcom's world and they can do, you know, they can, they can do whatever they want with the character. I have no, you know, I, I have, you know, I'm just honored to have, uh, to have played him, uh, for as long as I have. Yeah. And, um, and like I said, it's like my, my experiences with Capcom have never been anything short of A plus. Uh, Capcom has been very good to me and I have no complaints. But I think that's I think that one aspect is worth noting that during Dead Rising Four was right in the middle of of uh, very uh, intense negotiations between the Screen Actors Guild Union and the gaming industry. Yeah, and I think that affected a lot of games, not just with Dead Rising, but it obviously had an impact of, on RE2 remake, um, yep. and it's a lot of series that had these established actors that were part of the union. That were you know part of those negotiations, which you guys are completely entitled to. I think that should have been done a long time ago. It took too long to get to this process because there's a lot of stress that people don't see that goes into the performance capture for a video game or something animated, uh, especially right. in ADR where you're doing screams and you're turning up your voice and the physicality of doing the motion capture. That I'm glad that they finally have resolved it and that there's a better system in place to support the actors and and to take care and protect the actors and the talent. Uh, It just sucks that this happened in the case of uh, something where you have like talking to other actors that have been in this situation during this, during the um, negotiations and all this, there's an ownership there. You guys are attached to the character, but like you said, it's, it belongs to Capcom. The character is their property. 
you just have been fortunate to to be this character for so long and it's not i think it would be different if we're in a movie situation where like avengers obviously there was a recast before they really went into the whole avengers cycle with mark ruffalo taking over the bruce banner and the hulk but at that point um they hadn't established this system yet and now if you were to go back and be like okay in avengers 2 we just went ahead we recast you know tony stark you can't do that <laughs> robert Downey jr is tony stark you know yeah, yeah that's right right yeah that's right but but in but i think you know in in that example in a way you know recasting uh mark ruffalo as uh as bruce banner uh in a way it, it the reason it works i think in that case is because you know to be honest the the the, the previous hulk movies hadn't quite worked right right you know what i mean and so and and so the thing is is that if if they if those movies had been had been you know more successful then i think there would have been an audience attachment to uh you know to uh you know eric banner or um oh uh, god edward Rick, norton yeah right? edward edward norton yeah, yeah. Edward, or, or edward norton yeah you know what i mean but but it's like, but those movies didn't quite make the splash that Iron Man did. I mean, right. Iron Man changed, you know, was a game changer. Yeah, it really and was. So, and so as a game changer, it's like, no, you know, uh, RDJ is Tony Stark. And that's just, that's just how it is. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I mean, yeah. It's like, <laughs> you know, that's just, just how yeah. it is. Just like the whole cast is, they are their characters. And their their, right. their casting system is phenomenal. And they, they made a good choice. As much as I love... Uh, Eric Bana and Edward Norton, they're both phenomenal actors and they did great as the yeah. part of Bruce Banner, but Marvel hadn't really established this system yet that they have now. That's right. And Mark Ruffalo came in and they tweaked some of the seriousness to give him that comedy edge to make him, you know, science bros with Tony Stark and, and to have the, the relationship with Thor as Hulk was just a smart move. Um, yeah. But I don't think you could do that if with a virtual character like like Frank, you know, it's they're not seeing... Terrence the whole time they're seeing Frank they're hearing your voice but they're seeing a different person so yes. in that situation it's, it's got to be a little bit easier on them to be like okay the situation we're in uh we can't go get Terrence right now but we can pull somebody else and hopefully they can recapture the magic that Terrence brought to Frank but unfortunately the fans just weren't having it so I'm, I'm hoping yes. this doesn't kill the series now that we've come to a part with uh, the agreement between the, the guild and the the business part of it that I would actually, I want to see Dead Rising One remade. I would like to see a remake of it and have you come back again and all these beautiful graphics we have now and these amazing way of creating the games. It would be cool to go back and remake that one. I think it's a good time yeah. to do it too. Yeah, actually, uh, and actually, I'll I'll go out on a limb here, um, and uh, you know, I'll go and this is just this is just me sort of like musing, mm -hmm. but actually, I I would I I would be kind of interested. To see a crossover oh, with yeah. Frank coming, to, coming into Resident Evil, that would be cool. That and, would be really cool. And 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 sort of adding that, adding uh, you know, a, you know, bringing that sort of because because Resident Evil is very dark and it's very serious, but it, it might be interesting to see, you know, a kind of do a crossover where this character bring you know this this character whether I'm playing them or not, but brings a different sort of. Uh, uh, vibe to you know to uh you know to that franchise yeah and and you know and do the same thing that they've been doing in comics for for decades now which is you know do do crossovers we know? should and, see more and, of that uh, we really should see more of that marvel yeah. versus capcom is like the only real crossover we get but i would like to see right. that you know like you're saying i would like to see some of these characters pop up in different games like having frank show up in resident evil only makes sense even putting him in devil may cry which you've done uh, you were Credo in Devil May Cry 4, so you had that experience. Right. Um, again, that's your relationship with Ruben and Dan. You guys were awesome. <laughs> so, um, And you got to work yeah. with Johnny, another Power Ranger at that point. Uh, so that that was a cool, uh, you know, for you to dip your toes into it. But it would be neat to see Frank actually show up in one of these games. And Frank just seems like a guy who, you know, he'll, he'll, he'll find his way into the bad situation somehow. <laughs> Right, exactly, and and I mean, yeah, it's like I would be, I honestly, it's like I would be interested to see what what you know that character type, Frank's energy 
you know, do a do a Resident Evil story, you know, make everything that makes Resident Evil Resident Evil, but then introduce this character who's who brings in this kind of wild card, and he's not the straight arrow that that Kennedy is, or yeah, yeah. or you know what I mean? And it's like, yeah, it would it would be an he would be an interesting dynamic in that kind of storyline. That's just, and again, this is just me musing. I don't want to, yeah, you know, yeah, obviously we can't, yeah. Me to tell, tell Capcom what to do with their titles. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but you know, it's just, it would just be, you know, it's just, just as a thought, I was just, you know, it's like, Oh, that, that would, would be, be interesting. Fun. Yeah, it'd be fun. It's still, it's still the zombie genre, you know, in, right. in a sense. And, uh, so, you know, that might be an interesting, uh, interesting take on, on, on both of the franchises. You yeah, would, and with how uh, serious Resident Evil Two was, uh, very very serious, and the, and everybody I've talked to as far as the cast goes, with uh, with Nick and Jolene and Stephanie, have all said that they really wanted to capture that serious nature to it, make it a little more grounded and believable, even though it is a zombie apocalypse. But uh, by the time I was done playing it, I was like drained. It was intense, edge of your street, uh, edge of your sh- seat, <laughs> emotionally. Um, I felt exhausted when I was done, but having Frank show up at one point or another, or even having him as a, you know, a side character and coming in to be able to play as him would have been a nice chance to kind of catch my breath and, and be like, okay, yeah. I'm ready to go back into the seriousness. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, it, 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 yeah, it's, it's like that feeling. I remember, I remember when I saw the first trailer for uh, Avengers Infinity War mm-hmm. and there was a shot of, you know, and, and in the trailer, there's a shot of Thor and he's he's looking all threatened and like he's cornered and he goes you know and he says you know you know who the heck are you you know who the heck are you guys and you see it's the guardians of the galaxy you know yeah. it's like he, <laughs> and, you, and you just kind of have that breath of like oh oh cool you know it's like Thor with these guys you know what I mean it's like yeah it's, it's that kind of it's that kind of you know feeling of yeah. like oh okay now we're gonna have some fun okay. yeah and I think that you would know? fit well because it works so well in that series. In that movie, uh, every time the Guardians are on, there's a a break in the seriousness. There's a break in the uh, in not so much the drama, but the dread. And it's good yeah. to have that. It's well, good to have bring, that. Yeah, they bring they bring a levity. The thing yeah. is, is that it, it the circumstances are still as high, but they mm-hmm. bring a certain levity to to the to the circumstances that I think is in a way uh, that is a a bit of a relief for the audience. You know, just in terms of of pacing and, and storytelling. Um, again, uh, you know, I think Dead Rising is, is uh, well, sorry, I, I think Resident Evil completely works on its own and certainly doesn't need my help. It's, uh, but, but, you know, it's like I said, it's just, just a thought, you know, I was just, yeah. it's just, a, it's, you know, just me musing. I was just like, oh, well, you know, I wonder what Frank would do in a, in a, <laughs> in a Resident Evil story. I, I wonder how he would fare. You right. Know? As like, you're swinging the pipe around his Burke and you're over thinking like, what Frank do in this situation? <laughs> Right, exactly. You know, absolutely. And you're already on set, so why not? <laughs> right? Right. <laughs> right. Uh, you know? So we saw that uh, Dez Rising started, you know, several years ago, started to get this uh, rumor going that they're going to try and push for a movie. And I think everybody got really excited because they wanted to see this uh, awesome game brought to the big screen in some format. Uh, but then it came out. And given it's not a bad movie, I, I actually watched that recently too, just to kind of see it for the first time. And uh, see what it was about, so we can discuss it. But uh, highly disappointed that uh, it, I get like the new character Chase was a very interesting character, and the storyline was fun. But uh, and and Rob Riggle played Frank, which Rob Riggle's awesome. He's a funny, great actor. I love Rob Riggle. But yeah. did did anybody approach you about it? Did they ever ask like you to come on? I mean, you're Frank. <laughs> No, not at all. Not at oh, all. That's <laughs> upsetting. Not, not, not at all. And I mean, honestly, it's like I, I haven't been able to. Uh, I haven't been able to see that movie uh, mm-hmm. just yet. And but you know, I understand the. You know, there there are a lot. There are a lot of moving pieces with a film production, and there are a lot of reasons why certain choices get made as to casting and 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 plot and and all this. Um, so so yeah, it's like I didn't, you know, I I I certainly don't have any like, uh, uh, I certainly don't have any uh, animosity of like, oh well, why didn't they call me or you know and all like this. I I I can't as an actor, I can't, uh, you can't really, you don't own a character. Right. You, you you're given the opportunity to play a character, 
and um, and and that's wonderful. But but at the end of the day, the 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 character, in a sense, you know, belongs to the audience, right? And uh, and belongs to the fans, and I, I certainly have no ownership of it. Uh, so you know, I was just glad that again the the character and the franchise was so popular that people saw the value in making a live action film. Right. Right. Um, you know, to me right there, that's, that's a victory. That's a victory in and of itself. Um, and, uh, and I just appreciate the fact that somebody saw dead rising and was like, yeah, live action movie. Yeah. We could totally, you know, this is totally worth doing. Yeah. Um, that, that to me is, is, uh, is uh, validation uh, pl is plenty of validation. You know, that's a, um, that's a good so, way to look at it. To be like, yeah. to, to think they have that mindset. Well, the fact that it was actually made into a movie that um, I helped get it to where it is is enough of a victory in itself. To, to my hard work and my passion and the the love that people have given me for this character and helping create this character has led to a point where this character can come to the big screen. Whether it was you or not, but the fact that it got there is a big accomplishment. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, you know absolutely. I mean, I, I think that's you know, I, in a way, uh, yeah. I just I find that in and of itself very validating. Whether they, you know, so so yeah, nobody's under any, you know, I I I don't have any ego to bruise in that area. It's it's like you know, uh, yeah. Uh, I'm, I honestly, it's like I I really don't. Uh, I don't have that uh, kind of ownership. Uh, or or that kind of privilege, I should say, um, to to go well. The, you know, I'm Frank. They, you know, if, if 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 they don't call me, then the, then the then the whole movie's a, a a waste of time. No, no, of course not. Just just like it's you know, uh, yeah. And I mean, <laughs> maybe I'm reaching here, but just like <laughs> you know, nobody has any ownership over Hamlet. Yeah. You know, yeah. Hamlet. It's like you 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 just can't you can't have that. It's like you know, Richard Burton had his Hamlet. Lawrence Olivier had his Hamlet. Both are equally great. Both are, but both are different in their own ways because those are different people inhabiting that character. So, you know, to yeah. me, again, just the fact that they saw the saw the value in making a, a, a live action film of it, I, I'm just I'm proud of that. That's I take a certain kind of pride in that. Yeah, I think that'll be uh, good for the fans too. I think the fans that have are hesitant to see it or are angry about, you know, with the casting choices and stuff. It's nice to hear from the you know perspective of the person that they are so attached to. You know, there's a lot of people that are, have that loyalty to you that are mad at the movie, but hearing that your response of being like, Hey, it's, it's not something that's so personal. Um, just appreciate that the Frank is seeing the big screen. And I think that'll help yeah. them kind of ease over some of that um, hostility that the fans have. Still sucks. Yeah, it's, but, you know. yeah, it's like, yeah, it's it's still Frank. Yeah. it's like Frank is still there. It's yeah. like yeah, it's 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 still Frank. He may be you know a slightly different, just like you know different actors taking over Batman. Yeah, exactly, exactly. People, yeah, people love love Christian Bale uh, as as Batman. People love Michael Keaton mm -hmm. as Batman. But you know, but different characters come in and they bring out a different aspect, and it's it's all Batman. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Still Batman, even yeah. though it's a different person behind yeah. the mask, it's still Batman. <laughs> correct. And we gotta yeah, appreciate that we're getting more of that, and and that they're not just cutting it of the cord and saying, "Well, because someone didn't appreciate it, then we're just gonna cut it off and it's gone forever." At least in this case, we're still getting it. And I, again, I really hope that we can go back and uh, I would like to go back to the original game and see a remake done with today's technology. It would be beautiful. It would be so good. Yeah, from from your lips to God's ears, I you know it's like <laughs> I, I I I would love to see that too. Actually, I I would love to see that too. Whether whether I got the call or not, I I would love to see that too. You've been in the industry for a long time, not just you know the, the gaming wise, but like you said, it's been over twenty years. Um, and you came into it. Did you have intentions of coming in as you said you wanted to go as an actor? But how did you actually get into the stunt side of stuff? That's uh, I I love that question because I I. Because I actually, I kind of love my answer to that question because I've been asked that a few times uh, about, you know, well, how did you, how did you get into stunts? And, um, and, uh, I got into stunts through class, through Shakespeare. Oh, okay. 
to be honest. It's like, huh. if I'm completely honest, I got into stunts through Shakespeare. Because when I when I first started acting, I mean, I, I love classical theater, and I love, love Shakespeare. Um, and if my, if, if my career had just been doing, you know, Shakespeare on, you know, on, on stage, I'd, I'd be happy. You know, it's like, I'd, I'd, I'd die a happy man. But, uh, the way that happened was, was that, uh, in, uh, in Shakespeare, you know, particularly in Shakespeare, there was always some duel or some battle, you know, to do at the end of it. So, uh, uh, yeah, at the end of every Shakespeare play, there was always some duel or some battle to do. And when I would go and see Shakespeare, I would see these wonderful performances and, and actors doing a wonderful job. And then when it would come to those battles or to those duels, I all of a sudden became aware of two actors desperately trying not to hurt themselves or each other. Right, right. And so all that great performance would just kind of go out the window, right? Right, there becomes uh, because a disconnect. Be <laughs> whatever, yeah, and they'd just be like, you know, and all of a sudden you're just aware of two actors trying not to hurt or be hurt. And, uh, and so my goal was, was that I wanted to do the, I wanted to carry the performance all the way through and have the audience believe that, you know, yes, it's like, I'm, I'm handling a sword. I'm handling weapons competently. I am this guy, you know, even with a sword in my hand, you know, it's like, this is the character, you know? And so I took it upon myself to start learning combats in order to do that and, and portray it believably. And, uh, and so I was taking classes and tra and, and working with stunt people and weapons and in fighting and stuff like this. And then one day, uh, one of the guys I was training with, he came up to me and was like, Hey, I'm, I'm working on this. I'm working on this show, uh, Power Rangers. We need some extra guys. Are you available? <laughs> and, uh, and I was like, uh, sure, you know, uh, yeah. of course, you know, and I, you know, at the time I wasn't working much and I wasn't working much in film, uh, you know, I was, we all had our side hustles and, um, I was like, yeah, sure, absolutely. And so I, I showed up a couple of times and then, uh, the Japanese team, uh, alpha stunts, mm -hmm. uh, saw some value in me and, and were like, yeah, we can train this guy. And uh, so they start, they took me under their wing, and and that's how that kind of happened. Hey, you were on Power Rangers for a long time. <laughs> it's a very yes, several, I was. several seasons, several episodes, and many variety of uh, of enemies, and so many stunts performed. And they just kind of took you down yeah. this road. Yeah. Well, you know what? I'll I'll, I'll confess something. I I could have done that show forever. <laughs> I could have done that. I could have done that darn show forever because you still could too because it's still on. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but I mean, I really, I, uh, I really, the reason I did it for so long was because I, I loved the work I was doing, and I loved the people I was doing it with. Um, the power, the 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 Power Rangers crew and 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 team. Uh, when the show was here, you know, in in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it was and is, it, and still remains a, a very special group, and. Um, I just I loved going going to work every day because I I loved the people I was working with, I loved the things that I was doing because you know it was a, it was the perfect sort of synthesis between acting and and action. Right. Because what was great what was great about the Japanese team was they all con they all made a point of calling themselves they never called themselves stuntmen they always called themselves stunt performers and they always regarded themselves as as actors. Right. First. And uh, and I think that's why they saw the value in me because they were like, oh, this guy can act, and he's willing to you know throw himself into a wall as hard as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we can work with that. <laughs> right, you know? right. Um, and uh, but yeah, that's that's why that's why I was on that show for so long. I, I just I could have done that show forever. I, yeah. I really enjoyed the work I was doing and and the people I was working with. That was such a perfect answer as Frank as well. Your, your intro to that answer. I love this question because I love my answer. That sounds exactly like what Frank would say. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. But it's, it's yeah. true. Because, it is true. Yeah. Most stunt people, yeah. Most stunt people uh, come from, you know, either, you know, tournament martial arts mm -hmm. or the military or, you know, and, and that makes perfect sense. You know, yeah. or they come from, you know, elite gymnastics, stuff like that. And that makes perfect sense, you know, for, for the evolution of, of a stunt person, but I kind of, 
I, I have to say, I kind of like, you know, that I'm able to say, it's like, oh, how'd you get into stunts? Shakespeare. Shakespeare, yeah. What? You know, <laughs> you know, but that's that's really the truth. It's like I wanted to learn how to do those battle, those 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 battle scenes and, and, and learn to do that fighting as realistically as possible so I could more uh, more fully inhabit these characters. And and in learning to do so, that sort of was a natural segue into people going, hey, you're getting pretty good at this. We could use you over on this other thing if you're yeah. not too busy. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. And you've, you've been... And it was a chance. You've been yeah. in scenes with some of the best of them. You've you've gone up against some of the greatest uh, action, you know, uh, stars in the world, just getting taken down and putting it to them at the same time. Yeah. Yes, yes, I've been. Yeah, I, 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 yes, I've died many deaths um, <laughs> uh, at the hands of like Scott Atkins. I and, love uh, Scott Atkins, amazing guy. You know, phenomenal, yeah, phenomenal yeah, martial yeah. artist. <laughs> yeah, he's and he's a phenomenal person as well. He's yeah. he's a really. He's a really wonderful, wonderful guy to work with, and he's he, and he's an excellent, excellent actor. Yeah, excellent actor. I know he's trying to push for. Uh, speaking of Batman earlier, uh, some I don't I don't know how it happened, but he uh, was trying to put together an audition to be the next Batman. Uh, you know, working on the accent a little bit. If he can um, pull more of the American accent, I think he would. I would love to see him in the cast of Batman, just because I, of. I think he would be a perfect yeah, fit. He really would. Yeah. Uh, I he, think he, I think he would be a perfect mm-hmm. fit. Absolutely. It's like, I'll, you know, yeah, I got my vote. <laughs> totally, totally got my vote. Yeah. But you, you, know? you cross paths with so many, so many great action stars. Like you said, you've died so many deaths and it's, it's a very physically demanding and I'm sure you've got your share of injuries. Uh, how do you prepare yourself to get into the, the physicality of, of doing stunts and, and taking this beating and, and you know, dying all these deaths? Um, well, the, the maxim, the, the maxim is, is that when you're not working, you're training. Okay. And that's, and that's really, it's, it's really as simple as that. It's like, you just, you have to, that's the discipline. You have to train. Um, and, uh, you know, you have to, you have to train, you know, your fighting skills, your, your, your tumbling skills. And, uh, you know, it's, it, and that's the deal. It's like when you're not working, you're training. And, uh, when I'm not working, I'm, I'm in the gym. Uh, to be perfectly honest, and actually one of my biggest uh, safety precautions that I take is simply weight training. Um, okay, yeah. Weight training, just just you know, just going into the gym and 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 you know doing doing weight training has has helped me uh, avoid a, a great deal of injuries um, that uh, that that many of my uh, you know that many of my stunt family. Uh, have have not avoided and um yeah and i've been very i've been very fortunate but that's that's my thing is that uh you know because i i i grew up i didn't grow up uh very athletic i'm terrible at i was terrible at sport at, at uh, sports as a kid i didn't play sports it's like you know i was very much the outsider and uh but um i i sort of had this thing for for just training and uh, I think I attribute that, you know, a big a big character to me growing up was Batman. Yeah. And uh, and the whole thing was like, you know, and I wanted I wanted to be Batman when I was a kid. And so and what really got me about him was that he was self-made. And and there are all these scenes in the comics that, you know, when he's not out on patrol, he's in the Batcave, you know, work, you know, training. And so I kind of took that on as as a kid. And uh and you know, and I and I sort of have kept that throughout my life. Yeah, just constantly in the state of training, being prepared, uh, and keeping yourself healthy and, and safe that way. Yes. Um, adding yes. the 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 muscle mass of you know doing some weight training, but also the uh, the limberness of like you said, doing the tumbles and, and stretching and working on your uh, your fight choreography and making sure you're able to perform with these guys that are have this background in martial arts or in performance of this yes. style. Like you know, com- competitively like, talking about someone like Scott Atkins, who's you know um, yeah. a great, incredible, uh, award-winning martial artist, and then you are the guy that came from doing Shakespeare that wanted to sell your parts. So you got to be on a level physically right. able to compete with this guy to perform and sell your part with him. Yeah, I mean, and and I think that's the reason. I I think you know. Um, my thing has always been I die really well. Uh, <laughs> That's got to be like number one in your resume. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, because it's like I'm not going to compete with Scott Atkins, like in terms of of you know his moves are are insane. Yeah, are just insane. <laughs> yeah, I just I, I sometimes I, I look at the stuff he's doing and I just go, you know, that's not fair. How is it even I possible? Just, I can't do that. You know, yeah. it's like I just can't do that. But I can I can trash like, but when he hits me, I can trash myself really well and <laughs> and you know and and do that. And so I, I think that's. Bottom line is, I, I think that's the value that I bring. Is that is that I'm, you know, I, I die really, really well, and I get trashed really well. <laughs> that's like I said. That's the first bullet point on the resume. I die really well. <laughs> yes, I, I've actually have had that on my resume. Oh, nice. But, you know, <laughs> at one point, I had that on my resume at the line. It's like I die like no other. You know? <laughs> I love it. What do you think is probably the yeah, most yeah. Uh, dangerous stunt you've ever done? Uh, actually, the the most dangerous stunt I, I I did was actually not was just a few months ago. I was oh, wow. working on a film uh, in Kentucky. Uh, I was working on a film in Kentucky with uh, with uh, Guy Pierce. Oh, okay, and, yeah. And uh, I had I had to do I had to do a shot. I was I was you know you know a bad guy again. Mm-hmm. I mean I you know. Props to the bad guys, but I had to do the shot. I had to do the shot where I kicked in a door, and the door is booby trapped, and it and it explodes. Oh. And so I had to get I had to get yanked back on a wire and with with a rather sizable uh, uh, fire you know fireball you know uh, coming at me. Oh, and wow. um, and yeah, that was that was no joke. That was no joke. A lot could have gone wrong with that. And uh, we did the first take, and, and the thing was was that I was flying backwards and going into uh, a car windshield. Ooh. So, so yeah, there were there were a lot of moving parts on that one. Yeah, that's um, and, that, that's gotta be and, scary. Yeah, that, that <laughs> gone, yeah, that could have gone wrong. And as a matter of fact, the and luckily we got it, we got it beautifully on the first take. And, but when we did a second take, the uh, the stunt coordinator. Uh, decided that he wanted he wanted me coming out. He wanted to see me flying out of the fireball that was coming out of the door. Mm-hmm. And so when it, when it went off, uh, the second take we did when it went off, the the stunt coordinator lifted me up on the wire, but he didn't he didn't pull me out right away. And I could literally I could even though my eyes were closed and my you know I was holding my breath and my eyes were closed, I could feel the fire all all around me Oof. and then he pulled me out and i have to say it was only an instant but that was one scary nanosecond yeah i'm over here wincing in pain myself like uh, just imagining that's intense and that yeah. <laughs> that's the world you live in man that is crazy yeah. Yeah. i mean and that's exactly and it's like that's that's the job that's the discipline and uh if you're not down for that it's like you know best you don't even start yeah just go somewhere else because it, it takes nerves yeah. of steel to do something like that to know okay uh wake up in the morning i'm gonna grab my coffee have some breakfast you know get a workout in i'm gonna go to set i'm gonna get blown up today <laughs> and then you go home yeah. at the end of the day like how was your day yeah. oh, i got blown up <laughs> i got my face is all yeah. scorched and i got pushed into a car windshield <laughs> it's like ow right but I, I would say I would say more than more than nerves of steel because I I, I kind of I, I kind of back away from the whole machismo aspect of, mm-hmm. of and maybe machismo is the wrong word but but um, but to me more than that it's it's trust yeah you have to yeah. trust people you 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 have to trust the people you're working with uh, because if you don't have that you can't you can't perform properly yeah uh, you've and, got and, this. And, Fear. Yeah, and the thing is that, yeah, and that's what kept me on Rangers too. Was that I, I, I trusted everyone I was working with, the the Alpha Stunts team, you know, and and the uh, and the AAC team were were extraordinary people, just people to work with, and and I trusted them with my life, and I still do, I still do. It's that's like if they called me, if they called me for for something, it's like I I trust those guys with my life. Yeah. And you and, have to, you have to in that situation because yeah. you're putting your life in their hands for situations like, like you said, the one with the fireball and the, and the car windshield, anything that goes wrong in that, and that could be it for you. That could be your last day. That could be your last minute. Right. And if I didn't trust, if I didn't trust the guys setting the pyro, the guys who were pulling me on the wire, you know, it's like, then it, then it's my responsibility to go, Hey guys, um, 
you not no. Yeah. I, I can't I'm not I'm not for this. Not feeling this you one. <laughs> yeah. 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 So exactly. It's 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 my it becomes my responsibility to say, um, you know, let's let's find somebody because I'm not feeling this. Yeah. Have you had uh stunts go wrong in a movie, something that's left you like yeah, really, really injured? Oh uh, yeah, certainly. Uh actually, well, actually not many times, but but it has happened on occasion. I mm -hmm. mean, I've I've never um I I've I've never like had a major bone break or anything like that. Um but one of the worst times actually was when I I I was working on a show uh Beetleborgs. Yeah, Beetleborgs. And um, yeah, and I had to uh there was this one shot where I was uh you know, I was uh, in a monster suit and uh i was on the roof of this house and i had to jump and i had to jump off the house and i was basically jumping about two and a half stories Oof, yeah. down into into a pad mm -hmm. and uh and the thing was was that the monster suit had this sort of uh chest out in front of it so i couldn't see i wasn't able to look down Oof. and see the pad i just sort of had to trust I, it was a it was a trust fall. I had to basically just sort of jump off the house and jump off straight, you know, and then go into the pad. But I could never see the pad before I jumped. Yeah. And um, and when I jumped, uh, I I accidentally I stepped a little sideways. Oh no! And so I landed, I landed half on and half off the pad. Ow. And that was about yeah. And that was about that was about three to four months rehabbing my. Uh, my right shoulder because oh, yeah man. i landed i landed halfway halfway on the pad and and one of the stunt guys actually tried to catch me uh, you know <laughs> and he actually jumped in i mean you know this guy was a total hero but he totally jumped in and tried to make up for the missing part of the, of the <laughs> yeah, he became your pad your yeah. cushion <laughs> yeah and I, I was just like wow man you you could have and I mean, he could have really gotten hurt doing that, but he was like, well, I, I saw you were about to miss. So I just, you know, instinctually, he just jumped in. And, and that's, that was quite a heroic move on his it part. It really is. But that's, yeah. I, yeah. That's yeah. family taking care of each other. That's knowing, okay, this went wrong. Uh, it's probably going to hurt me, as, but it could hurt him a lot more. So. And, and that is, that is, you use the, the exact right word there, Jeff. That's, that's family. Yeah. That's it's family. family. Yeah. And we talked about this briefly before we really got into the uh, interview was uh, stunt. There's not a whole lot of acknowledgement um, or respect for the stunt world. People don't usually look for that kind of stuff when they're watching a movie or a TV show, they're seeing the characters perform and you know, the guys that are getting blown up and shot and kicked in the face. People don't usually think twice about that, you know? And I think, um, and I, I hope that there's more acknowledgement coming. I think you guys need to have, um, a more of an impact on award shows and more recognition throughout the, the industry. I, I, I yeah, I, but I, and I, I would agree with you. Uh, I do think that's changing. However, uh, I, you know, with particularly with the Marvel movies, there's been, I've noticed a shift in, uh, in the fans, even like acknowledging uh, the stunt people uh, and, and the actors, uh, you know, in interviews, uh, acknowledging their stunt doubles, which is, I think, is great. To yeah, see. yeah, I've seen that too. The actors themselves taking it upon them, you know, themselves to to share time with the, you know, uh, like The Rock buying um, his cousin, who's this um, one of his stunt yeah. actors, a brand new truck, yeah, or hanging out on set and taking yeah. pictures together. <laughs> yeah, and I, you know, one of the uh, one of the best examples, I think, honestly, uh, was uh, the actress, the actress who plays Nebula. And yeah. Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah, I thought she had an extraordinary. She had an extraordinary answer. Uh, to I saw in an interview, uh, the question was, uh, the question was about the, the question was a kind of a standard question about you know when you when we see ne you know when we see Nebula fighting, how much of that is you and how much of that is your stunt double? Mm -hmm. And uh, and and the actress, uh, uh, Jillian. Jillian, uh, I forget. Kilroy. <laughs> uh, I, I forget her last yeah, name. Yeah, I, I forget it too. Let me. I'll look it up while you're remember, explaining. <laughs> yeah, I remember, uh, yeah, I remember her from Doctor Who, and uh, Karen Gillan. Karen Gillan is her name. Yeah, oh, there we go. Yeah, um, but she had the mo she had an extraordinary answer to that to that question, and which was she said she said the way I see it 
She goes, my stunt double and I, she goes, I provide, you know, I, I, I provide the dialogue and the emotional aspect and, and she provides the movement aspect and together we create, we combine our abilities to create this character Nebula. Right. And I thought that was an excellent, excellent answer to, you know, to the contributions that stunt people, you know, bring to, to film and to story making process. It is a collaboration. And, um, and, uh, yeah, I, I, I think that kind of acknowledgement was, was quite special and, uh, and quite on point. And then yeah. you do see that because there is an active push now to have, you know, stunts recognized as an Oscar category now. Yeah. There, you know, it hasn't come about yet, but, but there is an open conversation that's happening about that. Uh, so I think there is a shift in, in the making. Yeah. And I hope it becomes more predominant. I, I want to see that. Like it's, you guys are, are sacrificing a lot and you're really asked to do a lot. Yeah. And people don't like realize because you're always focused on the lead characters of the movie that if you pay attention, you'll start to see some of the side characters, the guys that are constantly getting beaten up and taking these bumps are in a lot more movies than the lead character. You're going to start seeing them in everything. And there was a time like Jackie Chan had his stunt team. And if you ever watch a Jackie Chan movie, you start to see them reoccur in all of his movies because you start to recognize the faces. And I would, right. I would encourage the fans to go out there and start looking at the guys that are getting punched <laughs> and getting shot and start to recognize that, you know, get familiar with them because you're seeing them a lot more. And there are more than yeah. just that. Like, uh, there's a, a large part of the fan base for Resident Evil that I think there's there's probably a majority that knows that you are more characters than just, um, or let's say Frank, for example. Everybody knows you as Frank, but a lot of people didn't know you were Birkin as well. Or that you played Credo in Devil May Cry 4. Or, you know, all these uh, crazy movies that you've been in with all these awesome actors. And I hope right. they start to pay attention. Now they need to. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Now I will say this too. Now the counterpoint to that, and there, there is that now, and and particularly in the conversation about stunts getting recognized, uh, you know, by having its own Oscar category. The the flip side to that coin, and this is coming, this is also coming from the stunt community, is that with recognition comes ambition. Yeah. And yeah. there are a lot of there are a lot of people within the stunt community, and I think it's a valid point saying, well. If you if if uh, if stunts starts getting award recognition, then people are going to start wanting to do coming up with crazier and crazier stunts yeah. in order to in order to win that award. And things are going it's going to become a safety issue. Right, right. The the hazard and, level steps up because yeah, they're going to start pressing and, the issue, pushing the line, basically. That's right. And merely to get that recognition. And there are a lot of people with, there are a lot of stunt people who are saying, listen, the job of the stunt person is to be invisible. That's true. It's not yeah. about us. Yeah. It's not about us. We're, we're, we're there to serve the production and we're there to serve, you know, the, the, the other characters. We're not the stars. Yeah. We're and I was, uh, yeah. I was and thinking I think that too. That's a valid point. Yeah. I was thinking that too after the fact, after I said it, it's like the acknowledge that, they are doing so much for all these movies that you love, but also a big part of what you guys do is to not really be recognized because then it allows the the, uh, the viewers to detach from the bad guys, basically. That, yeah, and and that yeah, and that's that's right. It's it's like you know, and uh, correct, and um, and stunt people. I, I think there is a, a balance to be struck between uh, being recognized for your contribution, but not wanting to be the star right yeah uh, it's, you know it's a star, crazy career. Stars, have their, <laughs> stars have their place stars have their place right but stunt, but you know stunts are, are done in the service of a story and in the service of a production it's a good way to look so, at it it's, it's definitely a crazy a career <laughs> yeah there's a balance to be struck and i mean and even i have to strike it personally it's like when i come onto a production as an actor it's a very different mindset than when I'm than when I'm just as a as a stunt person. As a stunt person, I I I take the attitude that I'm I'm a soldier, and uh, yeah. uh, and, and I'm strictly here to soldier. But as an actor, that's a that's a slightly that's a shift in mindset 
because, you know, I have to bring my personality and I have to, as an actor, I have to take up space both on camera and on stage. As a stunt person, I'm, I have to be a little more, I, I feel I have to be a little more invisible and be more at the service of, of a production and that it's not about me. That's you a know? really good way to look at it. That's, I love talking about this with you because um, it gives insight to something that people don't talk about a whole lot. I, this is a very, very interesting topic to get into with somebody who's just, you know been doing it for so long, who's a career professional uh, stunt performer. Yeah. Uh, well, I appreciate you saying that. It's like, yeah. I, I uh, you know, I hope, uh, you know, I hope, uh, you know, yeah, I, I, I hope people find, find value in, in this perspective. If, you know, uh, I mean, and maybe it has no value. I don't know. It's just, it's just my take. Yeah. So uh, is there anything you can talk about that's coming up that you want to promote, maybe put out there for us to be looking for? I really can't. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know. I know. I got to ask like, just in I, case. I, I, I would love to, but I just, I just don't have permission. It's yeah. like, I, I, sound like, I feel like such a wimp for saying that, but it's, it's true. It's, yeah. There, there is, there is something, you know, uh, I am going to be starting work very shortly, as a matter of fact, uh, on, on, a on another performance capture project. Okay. I'm, uh, currently wrapping up, uh, wrapping up a really wonderful, uh, film right now. And, um, and I just recently worked on a, on a stage production but um, uh, the stage production I can talk about, but uh, but it's only local to Los Angeles. So, oh, okay, okay. Uh, but but uh, but yeah, the other projects I just I wish I could, I just can't. I, I'm I am I am contractually bound. <laughs> well, it's exciting to know that you're doing something uh, for the performance capture again. So I don't know what it's going to be for, but uh, I'm assuming something animated or video game related. So we'll definitely be looking forward to that. Um, yeah. And the movie. Uh, as soon as I can, as soon as I can talk about it, I will be. Trust. Well, that leads me to my next point. Uh, when you can talk about, it, when you're able to talk about it, uh, where can the fans find this information? Uh, your social media links, or something like that, or or anywhere they can follow you. Uh, sure. I mean, I'm not, I'm not super uh, social media savvy. I mean, I'm, I'm on, I'm on Facebook and I'm on uh, Instagram, and that's about, that's that's about the extent <laughs> of my. Of my social media exposure, yeah. I, uh, uh, yeah, I, I it, it's, you know, it, it's funny. I, I saw, you know, I, I, you know, when you sent me the, uh, the outline, I saw that question. I had to think about that and, <laughs> and really recognize it's like, oh, I'm not really that social media savvy. Me, me um, either. <laughs> but, but, but the truth is, I, I kind of, and, and the reason for that is, is that I kind of, in this business, I kind of regard myself as a mercenary. It's like as soon as I finish <laughs> one job, I'm 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 off to the next, and it's like that job's over. Next, you know what I mean, and just next. Yeah. And um and so yeah, I mean maybe I need to have a little shift of consciousness there. Um, <laughs> I love that. Yeah, though. I mean I'm on I'm on Instagram, and I'm always uh you know when uh, when Resident uh, when Resident Evil Two came out, I I. Uh, I posted about that and uh, posted, you know, a couple of things about that and, and uh, you know, a news article and, and on Facebook as well. So uh, people are always welcome to to uh, to follow that or, or uh, contact me there and uh, I'll do my best uh, to answer uh, when I'm not working. Is it just under uh, your full name, just Terrence Rotolo or what's the uh, the tag for it for your uh, your profile? Yeah, it's just Terrence Rotolo. Okay. <laughs> I, I'm keeping it simple. All right. And we'll put those links below for everybody. Uh, please go follow Terrence and keep up with them when he's posting stuff. Uh, I love the way you said that, though. I'm like a mercenary. <laughs> I, I move from job yeah. to job. I get a contract. I go execute. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. I, in that way, that's something, I mean, when I when I first started, actually, I always admired about Harrison Ford. Harrison yeah. Ford, it's like you never see him in tabloids because he, he shows up to work, he does his job, and he goes home. Yeah, it's it's good to have that. Nowadays, where everything... Uh, everything you do can be easily published and everybody can see and be involved in your life. It's nice to have that disconnect. But uh, I think it, it would be good uh, for everybody just to follow your accounts, at least the Instagram and Facebook side, and just keep up to date. So when you can talk about things, they can get excited or they can send you some feedback about how much they love Frank or your portrayal of Birkin or any of your characters, really. That would, that would be, yeah. And, and that would be great. I, I really, again, it's like, I, I, I can't, 
tell you how much I, I appreciate the fans, particularly, you know, the Frank West fans and, 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 uh, and the uh, Resident Evil fans. It's like, it's a terrific, you know, t- it's a terrific community of people. It really, really is. Cool. Well, I guess that's pretty much uh, any other parting words to him. I mean, I kind of covered it, huh? <laughs> uh, I think, yeah, I think we did. Yeah. I, I think we did. <laughs> And I kind of need to go to the bathroom. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, I appreciate you taking the time. This is a long one. And this is like your only day off. So I really, really got to say thank you for hanging out and talking. This is a fun conversation. I learned a lot. Thank you. so, uh, And thanks to you for reaching out. This has been a wonderful experience on my end as well. And uh, and uh, we should do it again. Yeah. I mean, yeah, know. definitely. Definitely. All right. Well, we will talk to you later. And um, well, thank you, everybody. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure you go follow Frank and uh, Frank. See, that's that connection right there. I keep hearing Frank in your voice. <laughs> Make sure you go follow Terrence and keep up to date with what he's got going on and show the love for, for Frank and for Burke and every character he's played. Well, that'll conclude our episode for today. If you guys enjoyed this episode, please leave a like and subscribe for more upcoming interviews with the cast of Resident Evil 2 Remake. The Residents of Evil is a Patreon-supported show, so if you'd like to help support the channel and unlock some great perks in return, head over to patreon.com slash rownetwork. This episode of the Residents of Evil podcast was brought to you by our Master of Unlocking Patreon members. The Patched Vest, Devil, Devin L. Dusso, Proxy One, Christopher Cedric, and Trent Overton. Thank you all so much for watching, and we hope to see you back at the Residence of Evil.